gives me real pleasure tonight to uh, introduce Brother John uh, to give his talk. Uh, John is our um, secretary on the leadership uh, team, and uh, he's just been an incredible encouragement in there, and we really uh, love his input in the, in the meetings, and we're happy to hear I'm from him tonight. This. What's that? I'm recording this. Oh, okay. <laughs> I told Dave that I was recording this. <laughs> um, so, this is a little loud. How's, how's the sound to you guys out there? Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, my name is John Cook. I live in Milton. Um, I am a technical writer by trade. I do a little creative writing for fun. The one thing you notice that I'm not saying in here is that I'm not a speaker. So that's the only apology you're going to get, but uh, uh, before, I may apologize more later. <laughs> so uh, this morning, Dan said that God interferes in the lives of men. Uh, God didn't call us to a life of comfort. Rather, he calls us to a life of obedience. Uh, fortunately, this also leads to a life of blessing, a life lived in relationship with the loving creator of the universe. This seems like a pretty good trade-off to me. I mention this because God calls us out of our comfort zone, and I'm here speaking to you instead of writing to you out of obedience. So I'm expecting a blessing because that's how God works. Um, so I wanted to talk tonight about who are the children of God and, and who aren't. Uh, let's start off with a couple icebreakers. Who here has children? Okay. Who here are children? That would be everybody. <laughs> See, that was really funny when I was writing it down. <laughs> uh, when Dan first asked this to come over the topic uh, or to, to pick one from the list, um, I wanted to, I was going to try something that I've done before for the, uh, the men's group, which is steal somebody else's notes and then try to regurgitate it. Uh, but I asked God what he wanted me to do, and he gave me an idea. That's kind of cool. When you ask God a question and he gives you an answer, that's kind of a, that's kind of a neat thing. I like reading uh, blog posts online, and uh, one of the guys that I follow is a Christian author by the name of Mike Duran. Uh, I share some of his posts with Dan and some of the other people. Uh, he was writing a post about Calvinism, and I came across a straight comment by a woman named Sarah Wittenhofer. Uh, responding to a larger topic, she wrote, uh, number one, we aren't all God's children, so that the analogy of running into traffic only goes so far. And then she makes the rest of her point. But that got me thinking, um, do we know that? Are we, is it true that we're, we are not all children of God? Because I have heard many times that we're all children of God. God is the father of all of us and so forth. And so I thought it would be fun to research this a little bit and say, see what scripture has to say. Um, but first I'd like to tell a story about family, because when you're talking about children, you're talking about family, and I have a family story. Um, when my dad was uh, dating my mother, he uh, visited their house the first time. He had on his suit and his coat, because this is the 50s, and that's what she did. And uh, you know, hello, Mr. Hunt. My name is John Cook. That's my dad's name. And they said, you know, John, why don't you come in and have a meal with us? He said, okay. And so he sat down, and they were having, I think, a roast. And uh, Mr. Hunt took his meal, and Dad thought, well, I'm a visitor here, so I'll just take a slice or two of meat and little potatoes, and he passed the, the plate around. Well, my mother has an older brother and a younger brother, and they're very protective. But they're also young men, and they eat a lot. And so he passed the plate to Rob, my Uncle Rob. Rob takes all his meat on his plate. He passes the bowl around. By the time he gets around to Jimmy, Jimmy takes the rest of it onto his plate, and Dad realizes there's no more food left. And uh, he thought, 
Okay, I see how it goes. So the next time he visited the house, he sat down, hello, Mr. Hunt, and uh, the, pl the plate came to him. He took this big pile of stuff and pulled it on his plate, and in unison, the boys said, hey. And they said, what, what gives? He says, I've been here before. So let's talk a little bit about the fatherhood of God. Let's start there. Uh, you know, if I would have been smart, I would have had a copy of the sheet that I gave you. Okay. So I have a number of verses here. John 1, 12, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Near the end of the 19th century, the discipline of comparative religions was incorporated into universities across the Western world. Um, this next section here I got from R.C. Sproul. So this sounds really smart. It's because he's the smart guy. Uh, he writes that the advances in technology and travel dramatically shrunk the world, thereby bringing previously isolated beliefs and practices into inter interaction. Uh, therefore, people began to study and compare the different world religions arriving in their neighborhoods. During this time, scholars attempted to find the essence of all belief systems. German liberalism was particularly keen at, in identifying the Wesen, or substance, held by all world religions. I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. Um, many of these thinkers said that all religions shared the same end, and so began, professors began seeking for this common denominator. Adolf von Harnack, a famous professor of church history, wrote a book that perfectly models the thought of this period. Uh, in his book called What is Christianity, Harnack defined the essence of the Christian faith as the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, Rob Bell um, had a book not too long ago where he talks about this kind of universalism. Uh, Harnack's indebtedness to liberalism, humanism, and universalism is apparent in his book as it denies the exclusivity of Christ. Uh, let's see, Acts 17, 24 through 28. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. This is what Paul was um, uh, telling the Athenians at the Areopagus as he was uh, arguing in favor of the, uh, the unknown God. To be true to scripture, we affirm the universal creation of the creatorhood of God, for all people are made by him. However, he is father only to those who believe in his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke, we find out who our neighbor is. This morning, Dan find a neighbor as your near one. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, we see that Jesus starts off, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus commands us to pray, Our Father. Every time we pray these words, we imply that there are others who are not his children and thus testify, testify to his, his exclusivity. When we affirm God's uniqueness and confess that salvation is found in Jesus alone, we, we say, Our Father. Uh, let's see, in John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you hear that uh, there are many roads to heaven, uh, uh, we have a room with many doors, that's not what scripture says. Scripture says there's only one way, and that way is through Jesus. There's only one God, the only way to him is through faith in Jesus Christ. Our culture hates to hear this, preferring to believe in a God who disregards sin, who makes no demands. If you serve the only true God, then stand firm against those who say all roads lead to heaven. And then to sum up, this is the bit that I remembered. Instead of teaching the universal brotherhood of men, the Bible teaches the universal brotherhood of believers and the universal neighborhood of men. We're going to talk about neighbors in a little bit. 
So I need some volunteers to look up scripture verses. Um, we're going to go right down the line here under the section Children of God. I need somebody to read Colossians 1.16. Dave's got that. Somebody to do John 3.16. Lindsay? John 1.12. Okay, Linda? John 11.52. Jerry? Romans 8.16. Aaron? No, you're volunteering, uh, Allison? Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. First John three one through ten. That's a longer section. Okay, Elaine. Uh, let's let's stop there. All right. Who's got Colossians? This section is who are the children of God? Colossians. Okay, uh, John three sixteen. All right, John one twelve. John eleven fifty two. Okay, and then the verse four before that says, He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but for the scattered children of God. Uh, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. All right, and then the big section here, 1 John 3, 1 through 10. Okay, all right. You know what? This is a long section. Do you mind if I read it? Okay, First uh, John 3, 1 through 10. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what, it will, what, we, will be, what, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in, in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. All right. The Bible is clear that all people are God's creation. We saw that in the Colossians section and that God loves the entire world. We saw that in John 3.16. Only those who are born again are children of God, and we saw that in these other verses. Now, what, before um, we, well, I got up here to talk, Dan and I talked a couple of times about what it is the Foundation Church teaches on this uh, topic. And he said, uh, all people are children of God by creation, but those who believe in Jesus Christ are children of God by adoption. So we're going to get into adoption here for in a moment. This is kind of interesting. In Scripture, the lost are never referred to as children of God. So when the world tells you that we are all children of God, that's an interesting philosophy, but that's not scriptural. Uh, Ephesians 2, 3 tells us that we are saved. Uh, before we were saved, we are by nature objects of wrath. Uh, Romans 9, 8 says it is not natural it is not the natural children who are God's children. It is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Uh, the NIV says it's not the children of physical descent. Instead of being born as God's children, we were born in sin, which separated us from God and aligned us with Satan as God's enemy. Uh, let's see, James 4.4, 4, we see, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Um, Elaine, would you like to look up 1 John 3, 8? 
That's fine. I'll come back to you. You let me know when you're there, okay? Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but you sent me. This is uh, John 8, 42. Then in a few verses later, Jesus told the Pharisees, I think we covered this this morning in uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. The fact that those who are not saved are not children of God is also seen in 1 John 3.10. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil, and we went through that section before. Uh, let's see, okay. So adoption, let's talk about adoption. So how, how do we become children of God if we aren't, if we're separated from God by sin? Do you, do you have it? All right, go ahead. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Elaine. So what is adoption? Adoption has been called the highest privilege that the gospel offers. If we were to go by the attention given to the uh, doctrine of adoption, this is hardly a majority of opinion. It was with amazement that the Apostle John exclaimed, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we'd be called children of God. That's in 1 John 3, 1. Yet most seem to think that that we are all natural children of God, that he is universally father of all. The Bible asserts that by nature we are children of wrath. There is no universal fatherhood of God or universal brotherhood of man. The Bible speaks of universal neighborhood. All people are my neighbors, and I am to treat them with Christian love. Not all people are my brothers and sisters. That kinship only comes through adoption. Jesus is God's only natural son. All others enter his family through adoption in Christ. We become children of God when we are saved because we are adopted into God's family through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Let's see. Let's look at Galatians 4 and Ephesians 1. Uh, Galatians 4, 5 and 6, and then Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and I'll read that bit. Yeah, why don't you read 1 through through like 7? Just do that whole section there. All right, and then the Ephesians passage, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship to Jesus Christ, in according with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in, who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So this can clearly be seen in verses like Romans eight fourteen through 17, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So those who are saved are his children uh, of God through faith, faith in Christ Jesus, because God has predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ and according to his pleasure and will. All right, so that's adoption. So we've got some privileges of being children of God. Uh, I have many of these and many verses. I'm going to try to get to these rather quickly. Uh, the first uh, privilege is inheritance. As children of God, we become heirs to the inheritance of God. Uh, innocence. As children of God, we are to have a heart of innocence like a child. We should be free from all malice and guile and wickedness. We should be humble as a child. God wants us to be as wise as serpents, but harmless as a dove. We should be mature in understanding, but in malice be like an innocent child. Uh, instruction. As children of God, we'll be instructed by God. Like a good father, he will correct us and discipline us. God chastens those whom he loves. Therefore, as God's children, we must be willing to receive his instruction and correction and guidance. Uh, we are created in the image of God. We must be conformed to the image of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants every one of his children to grow into the likeness of his son. Uh, we are instruments. As children of God, we must be an instrument in his hands. God wants his children to work in his vineyard and to share his responsibilities. We've been talking about the vineyard in church. There's an enormous task for the church to finish, and as God's children, we have a sacred duty to do everything we can for God. Uh, intercession. As children of God, we have the privilege to present our needs to him. I mentioned that I asked God for a topic, and he gave me one right away through a blog post on the internet. Um, intervention. As children of God, we have the privilege to experience God's intervention when we're in trouble. How many people here have felt God's intervention when they're in trouble? I can't. There you go. I mean, it's so many of us. Um, I've got some others here, other privileges. We're able to talk to God and relate to him as a good and loving father. Uh, we may take this for granted, but our father, Heavenly Father loves us deeply. Uh, we're led by the Holy Spirit. Because of the saving work of Christ, we enjoy the new life of the Spirit. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. We read that verse earlier. Uh, God disciplines us as his children. This is actually good news. Uh, the trials and tests we face in this life prove our sonship. It also requires us to respond with perseverance. Uh, Hebrews 12, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when, uh, when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It's not fun at the time, but it's actually good for us. Uh, we relate to other believers as members of one family. Uh, in Milton, we have a, uh, a youth group called Koinonia. It's a, this sense of fellowship and oneness. I think of it as a, a heaven as sort of this sanctified party. It's a, it's a really great atmosphere. Um, we imitate and honor, honor our Father in heaven. We are to imitate God's holiness in our conduct. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. That's Ephesians 5. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's Matthew 5. Uh, let's see here. How are we doing on time? Okay. Well, uh, I've got 12 other privileges. Do you want to go through those? Okay. Thomas Watson wrote, if we are children, then God will be full of tender love and affection for us. Um, if we're children of God, uh, we will, God will bear many infirmities. A father bears much with a child he loves, which he must love me a lot. If we're children, then God will accept our imperfect services, like when you have a writer up to speak. Um, a parent takes anything in good part from his child. God accepts for, uh, for the... God accepts of the will for the deed, that's 2 Corinthians 8.12. If we're children, then God will provide for us. A father will take care of his children. He will give them an allowance and lay up a portion, so does our Heavenly Father. If we're children, then God will shield off dangers from us. A father will protect his child from injuries. God ever lies sentinel to keep off evil from his children, uh, both temp temporal evil and spiritual evil. If we're children, then God will, re will reveal to us the great and wonderful things of his law. Uh, being a child of God gives us boldness in prayer. Uh, if we're children, then we're in a state of freedom. 
of the children of God, though they are not free from the being in sin, yet they are freed from the law of sin. So that's kind of good news. If you're children, then we're heir, heir apparent to all the promises. I like that. If we're children, then we shall have our Father's blessing. They are the seed that the Lord has blessed. When I got married, I asked my father uh, to bless us at our wedding, and, uh, and he did, and that became a family tradition. He performed a blessing at my sister's wedding and at my other sister's wedding. And, uh, and then I was able to <laughs> I was able to pray a blessing at um, Mike and Ashley's wedding. That was really important to me. Uh, lastly, if we are children, we shall never finally perish. John 5, 24, John 10, 8, 28. Those who are adopted are out of the power of damnation. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's Romans 8, 1. Because this is so sweet a privilege and the life of a, of a Christian's comfort lies in it, therefore I shall clear it by arguments that the children of God cannot finally perish. The entail of hell and damnation is cut off, not because that the best, not but that the best of God's children have that guilt which deserves hell, but Christ is the friend at court which has begged their pardon. Therefore the damning power of sin is taken away which I prove thus, the children of God cannot perish because God's justice is sanctified for their sins. The blood of Christ is the price paid not only meritoriously but efficaciously for all of them that believe, and that's Thomas Watson. Uh, so finally, let's talk about neighbors or the near ones, as Dan mentioned this morning. Right, and so that's the next section that we're going to get to here. So it occurs to me that one of the reasons is some ask the question, who are the children of God, is to determine who we are and who they are to define who to love and who to hate, who to support and who to fight. God does not give us that option. If we have one set of standards for brothers in Christ and another for neighbors, it's not to know who to fight, it's to know who is already saved and who else needs to be saved. Uh, it's true that we do fight in this world, um, and we are indeed in a war, but that war is spiritual nature and not, uh, and our foes are our own sin nature and Satan and his forces. Uh, the lines are not drawn along racial lines, black or white, or gender lines, male versus female, nor class lines, privilege, occupation, what side of the tracks to live on. The lines are spiritual. Uh, Ephesians 6.12, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and, wickedness in high places. And we saw this morning uh, the great commandment and the great commission. Uh, teacher, what's the greatest commandment of the law? The lawyer asked. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, what's the application? I, asked, I had to ask Dan, what application meant. He said, what, the, what was the application? I said, I don't know. You'll have to tell me what that means. So the application is, how do we, how do we help our, neighbor, our neighbors become brothers? Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, that is not so much our work as this, that the dead in sin should live, that spiritual life should quicken them, and that Christ should reign where the prince of the power of the air now hath sway. You preach, brethren, with this object, that men may quit their sins, and fly to Christ for pardon, that by his blessed spirit they may be renovated and become as much in love with everything that is holy as they are now in love with everything that is sinful. You aim at a radical cure. The ax is laid at the root of the trees. The amendment of the old nature would not content you, but you seek for the imparting by a divine power of a new nature that those who gather around you in the streets may live unto God. So how do we help our neighbors? How do we help people to become believers? Uh, I've got a list here. First is to do your homework. Uh, anticipate the different kinds of questions that your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors will have when witnessing opportunities arise. Not everybody's questions will be the same. Uh, learn to listen. Um, we must genuinely attempt to understand what the person is saying and what his perspective is. As you listen, ask yourself, is this the real issue or is this merely a symptom of something deeper? Remember to keep an open ear to the Lord. Let him speak to you about what the person you're talking to. Uh, use questions wisely. Ask questions of the person in an attempt to answer his questions. 
uh, embrace humility. Don't come across as a know-it-all. Humbly admit there, there are some questions you don't know the answers to, but you know where to bring them to. You know where to get those answers. Um, this says don't pressure people. I'm not sure that that's always right. I think there are times to be bold, and I'm learning that here. Uh, trust God at all times. Many disastrous results could be avoided by simply following this rule of thumb. Remember that Jesus did not pressure the rich young ruler to follow him. Jesus presented the truth, which included what I call the sacrificial demands of the gospel in a conviction-filled yet pressure-free environment. Trust in God's power, not yours. Uh, let's see. So finally, I have um, a link here at the bottom that you can look up online. The Great Commission Conference that we're loose, loosely affiliated with is a very good booklet called Do You Know For Certain? Uh, it's a gospel booklet that presents the gospel in a clear and simple format using this illustration of the bridge that we've talked about before. You know, the sinner is on this side and Christ is on the other side, or God is on the other side. And how do you get, how do you get across that chasm? And it answers the question, how can I be certain that I'm going to heaven? And that's what I have for tonight. Who are the children of God? Those who love, their, who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, as we see in Romans 8.28. And that's it. Who would like to close in prayer? Aaron. So who's next? Do you know who's up next? Okay. Well, uh, keep uh, keep ears open because we'll have some other uh, folks from the leadership council also getting up here and trying their hand at this. So, thank you very much. Good night. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.